everyone and welcome to a very special event as part of our endeavor to showcase inspiring Indians who make us proud. A very warm welcome to our past chairs, GB members, sponsors, and members of the press today. We had promised you a month of giving in Flow Chennai, and I'm humbled to speak about some social initiatives that we are flagging off this month, which will help to economically empower and help deserving women in communities around us. The first is a livelihood support program to help a cooperative of 75 tribal women in rural Tamil Nadu. We are sponsoring orders for chemical-free household products, Diwali gifts, handicrafts, and giving them work in terms of making reusable masks so that they can support their family with dignity. We are restarting the masks initiative with three deserving community women groups and while most of them will be paid forward by redistributing among frontline women workforce, some can be ordered for personal <laughs> use as well. We will be talking to you more about this in our WhatsApp group. We are really happy to say that we partnered with HeyDD this year to provide professional skill training and employment to 20 women so they can be employed by e-commerce companies in and around Chennai. This program has been sponsored by Creedai Chennai and promises to transform the lives of these young women. We are program with Mishra Police in Chennai. We are distributing sanitizers, gloves, and masks among 20,000 women police force in certain very, very demanding areas of our city that are affected by the COVID. And now coming on to nicer things, I would like to share a video that has been created for Flow portraying artists from across our country as a unifying factor of our rich diversity. And I would really like to thank our member, Sharon Aparao, for helping us with this. Could we have the video, please? Thank you, Sharon, again. You're welcome. And now to our event for the evening. It is a pleasure and a privilege to welcome Sunita Kohli, a highly accomplished interior designer, architectural restorer, and author, and a Padma Shri awardee as well. She will be in conversation with our dear member, Sharon Aparao, who we all know so well. Thank you so much, Sonu, again. And of course, Vidya Singh, without whom we would not have been able to put this event together. Thank you so much, ladies. And now over to Prasanna. Thank you, Rinku. Good evening, everybody. Uh, before the program starts, I would like to just touch upon some tech etiquette. 
and also quickly inform you about our future events. This event will last approximately one hour and um, there will be a question and answer session at the end of the call. And if you have any questions for our speaker, please submit them via the Q&A feature on your Zoom screen and we will get to them during the Q&A session. Please note that this call is being recorded for our records. Um, we have the following events coming up this month. Um, we have Making Designs by uh, Nishita Chaudhya on August 25th. And uh, we are proud to launch our Flow Mentorship uh, Cell for Chennai on August 27th. Now moving on to the event that uh, we are all eagerly waiting for. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Sharon Aparao. Sonu has been associated with the visual arts for over three and a half decades, working primarily with art from India. She is known to work with very young artists, putting them on the map of art. She has been acknowledged and followed keenly for her sense of aesthetics and sharp eye in picking the best artists and giving them the platform and confidence to shape themselves for the future. Having worked with great well-known artists very early in her career, her exposure allowed her to work overseas with Indian art when it was hardly known. Today, her outreach allows for the crafts and ancient art arts of India to be shared in lectures, workshops, and destination lectures. Sharon, over to you now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prasanna, and thank you so much, Rinku. Thank you for inviting me to do this with somebody who is a very dear friend and who I'm so happy to be in conversation with. So let me introduce Sunita. Sunita Kohli is a globally recognized national award-winning interior designer furniture manufacturer and architectural restorer since 1971. Her professional portfolio includes several significant public and heritage buildings, hotels and hotel boards, forts, palaces, libraries, museums, and select residences in India, Egypt, Pakistan, Bhutan, and Sri Lanka. She is the president of K2 India, an award-winning architectural and design firm whose CEO is Kohilika Kohli, her daughter. Sunita Kohli is the former chairperson of the School of Planning and Architecture in Bhopal. She has lectured and presented papers on the various subjects at several universities in the UK, USA, and Southeast Asia. She is the first Indian woman to lecture at the National Buildings Museum in Washington, DC. In 1992, Sunita Kohli was conferred the Padma Shri for her contribution to national life in the field of interior design and architect architectural restoration by the president of India in New Delhi. She was the first woman to get uh, this award in this field and nobody since has got this award. And she was only 36. Following this, she was presented the Mahila Shiromani Award by Mother Teresa in Kolkata. She was also the first woman in India to be appointed to a National Institute of Excellence. So we have with us Sunita, who we are so, so happy to share uh, your journey and talk to you today. So Sunita, let's, let's uh, share what, what you have with the rest of the team here. So you grew up in Lucknow and now live in Delhi and you're extremely, extremely well-traveled. How has this travel, especially within India, impacted your career, your work and your life? Tell us about it. Uh, so no, firstly, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. And thank you, Fiki, Flo, uh, Rinku, Vidya for inviting me for this. You know, I love Chennai, so I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And uh, really, congratulations on the work that you're doing. I think it's all very commendable. So uh, you mentioned Lucknow as the place where I grew up. Yes, I do not think that I could ever have been a designer had I not grown up with the way Lucknow influenced me. But I was born in Lahore. And this is the Red Fort. And my mother is from Balochistan, from Quetta. 
uh, because they're all they're also Hindus in in Quetta. And my father is a Rajput whose family had migrated to Lahore many many generations before. So he's a naturalized Lahori. So having given that very quick backdrop, this is Lahore, which is an equally culturally rich uh, rich uh, city as Lucknow. And this is the exquisite Shish Mahal uh, that is inside the fort. Now, you know, all these have highly influenced, I mean, this was just all the influences that one was absorbing. This is the Rumi Darwaza, which we saw together in December with, the, with Sharan and a group from South India, believe it or not. And this is the Bada Imam Bada, another view of the Bada Imam Bada and La Martine, which we saw. And this is the group at the residency. And that's Sono inside the chapel of La Martine. It was a wonderful trip. But I have to say that Lucknow uh, influenced us just, I mean, one was, one was the architecture, which is really history built in stone, which one was exposed to. And also, this uh, the left view is of Hazrat Ganj, and you see Universal Booksellers right below. Universal Booksellers is where uh, he began, <clears throat> Vikram said began a suitable boy, which is much in the news right now. So I thought I should point it out. And this Kapoor's Hotel, this rather decrepit building, which I'm showing now, is because uh, you see a 19... 47 dinner, which was at rupees four. It used to be a very swanky place at one time. And Kapoor's is also, they used to hold uh, uh, auctions of sales and of uh, jewelry and art and everything. And this is, believe it or not, where I bought my first item at auction, a string of emerald pearls at age nine. Of course, I've gone on to many auction houses but this is where it began. And of course, Lucknow also influenced one because you have the Bhatkandi school and I have, uh, everybody learned music uh, in the afternoons. I also have the equivalent of a, uh, of a BA, which is called Visharat in Hindustani classical music. So, <clears throat> I mean, there are so many influences and the biggest, of course, being my parents who both love to read. So, uh, should we go on to the other projects from here? Uh, you've had a lot of cultural influences. Your travels have helped a lot. Your travels to all these many uh, cultural spaces in India have played a role in your uh, work, Sunita. Do you want to lead us a little bit uh, on to that before we go to the fabulous Rashtrapati Bhavan project? Sure. You know, uh, I grew up in, I mean, I've, well, I did my college in Delhi. So Delhi has also been a big influence. And we, when we speak about Delhi, it's, uh, Delhi has three world heritage sites. And it's considered one of the oldest capital cities in the world. Uh, I won't keep mentioning what they are because they're written on the screen so we can move a little faster. And this of course is the most beautiful mosque in Delhi, Turkish 14th century. And the Red Fort, the Red Fort, why I'm showing is because it has played a seminal role in what Lachians also did. And Humayu's tomb, which as you know, is the basis of the Taj Mahal. These have all played important roles in my work later on. And then Fatehpur Sikri and further up north, the, the, the Harmandir Sahib. And then when we come to South, so I showed the North and the South, uh, you know, I love to travel because I think there is nothing the equivalent of building up a visual education. So this Living Chola temples, one has done before, one has done a wonderful trip with Sono, and this is Darashurum, and uh, and this is not a world heritage site uh, in Sri Rangam. And the reason why I showed this Mysore painting, which I have, is because Sri Rangam is the largest temple in India. And uh, this wonderful painting shows the seven concentric uh, walls that are there and everything which is on elevation, as you know, are the uh, various, uh, uh, various temples that exist over there. 
And this is, this is part of another trip of which we did uh, the Hoysala temples in Southern India. And here you see the great temple at Somnathpur and the group sitting there, which of course was led again by Sonu. She organizes the most wonderful trips. And most of these are friends from South India. On the same trip, one, one went to the exquisite Tipu Sultan summer palace. I mean, just look at the color palette. I mean, these are all influences that, uh, you know, one never knows when they come up, but they influence one because I think our culture is so rich and so diverse. I get on to Hampi, uh, which I've done several times. I mean, all the World Heritage Sites one has done many, many times over, some with Sono, some without. And, um, and you see this in, I always, I always maintain that Indian buildings are so syncretic. They took from Hindu and from, uh, from Muslim architecture. And of course, in some places from Jain and there's Christian art. And these are buildings in Hampi, which are typical of that uh, syncricity. The wonderful elephant stables. And then this is a trip again with Sonu. And though I've done this before, Ajanta Elora and the beautiful frescoes. I mean, the examples of art that we have are so extensive in our, in our country. And this, as you know, uh, Kailashnath is the largest monolithic structure. One is wonderstruck with the sort of, uh, with the sort of craftsmanship that has existed. I mean, craftsmanship that, that could only be, not only were they, uh, you know, wonderful stone sthapatis, but they had to be engineers, architects, dancers, musicians. And the same thing applies on the East now I've come to, I mean, I'm going through India at a very fast rate as quickly as I can. Uh, this is the Lingaraj temple and why I'm showing Eastern India is because I did one of my most, uh, 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 I mean, I did a hotel there for the Oberoi's and uh, this is Lingaraj, I'm research based, this is Konarak. And this is the Mukteshwar temple, which has a beautiful ceiling and which I, uh, I use the central part of it in a hotel that I designed for the Oberoi's in 1983-84. And the central, this motif is actually a graphic plan of the ceiling of the Mukteshwar temple. And further down one goes and uh, there is a staircase, uh, which I'm not showing here. And there the ceiling of it becomes the actual plan of the Mukteshwar temple. So this is, but done in a very contemporary way. So this is how one gets influenced by travels. I mean, not exactly what is there, but what exists in the spirit of it. These are the exquisite terracotta temples uh, in, uh, in Bishnupur, again, in Eastern India. And, uh, but I used this art when I did, uh, I did the, the huge restaurant in Nepal, in Kathmandu, because there also in Bhaktapur, they have used uh, terracotta uh, architecturally very, very extensively. So from where one sees, from where one uh, applies it to, how one applies it to, of course, always with local craftspeople, this has carried on for, uh, next year, I would have been working for 50 years. So that's how long one has been doing all this. Uh, then <clears throat> this is Western India. It's the Jami Masjid, which is 1513 in Champaner Pavagar, which was the first capital of Gujarat. And I show this um, Jami Masjid because in the main prayer hall, there are a thousand lotuses that have been carved. And these lotuses were carved by Hindu craftsmen for an Islamic mosque. And these are the sort of things that I want to speak about how diverse and rich our culture is. <clears throat> of course, we've got numerous Christian um, churches throughout India and having grown up in a Roman Catholic convent, I mean, going to mass is as integral to my way of life as going to a mandir is. Uh, then this is the Jahaz Mahal at Mandu. Now, several of these buildings that we have seen and uh, uh, are not are yet to be listed in the World Heritage Site list. They are they are there, and I hope that they very soon get listed. 
and maybe we can uh, sonu maybe we can do a listing of our own we don't need unesco to do a listing no oh, because we've got 10000 monuments of which till recently only 3500 were protected now it's the number has got, gone up to 5000 i mean we can have another separate talk on this all together because the subject is so vast and as <clears throat> we all know and we've all seen together also that it has the most sophisticated water harvesting system in india and one of the most sophisticated in the world and the, these buildings are only 500 years old i think vidya you were also we were all together on this trip which was amazing so these you again you see how they purified water how they harvested water and then we come to central india as central india it has three world heritage sites i'm speaking specifically of madhya pradesh the kendari of mahadev temple and sanchi which is the oldest buddhist monument in the world where borobudur is the largest and uh, whilst i was uh, whilst i was uh, the chairperson which you mentioned uh, sonu of the school of planning and architecture there are three major projects that i took on one was a writing of architecture from an indigenous perspective and i'm happy to say that a few of these workshops be held in sanchi itself and these were with great experts uh, <clears throat> now this i also uh, as chairperson i championed a project which is in asha puri uh, in madhya pradesh of course for our conservation architects and uh, here there are it's 7th century there are 27 fallen temples and our students they uh, identified every historical rock and three of uh, these this what is called stitched up and the photo on the right is a site museum and you can see the you know site museums of of such riches from the 7th century are not quite what they should be but that is the state of conservation in our country and i think we can all work towards how to set these things right because as in england the national trust was set up by one woman working from her kitchen table so i'm sure with all you wonderful people we can plan to do something towards seeing what we can do for conserving our heritage Yes that's true Sunita we our heritage is so rich we are so lucky we have year, thousands of years of heritage and yes. you know what other countries there other countries only have a fraction of this and they don't actually uh i mean they talk about it in a way that i think we can learn a lot from yes. and going from this ancient world and coming to what the colonial era was one of the most prestigious projects obviously has been this fabulous rashtrapati bhavan which is also in the news now and this is a dream for any designer uh to work with and i know your deep association with luchens and the luchens society so uh, tell us a little bit more about luchens about delhi and about your fabulous project with rashtrapati bhavan and hyderabad house well i came into conservation really after i'd been working for 10 years and this was i was first asked to work on uh work on hyderabad house because the queen was visiting and to set up just a few of uh, the main um main state rooms for that particular visit as also uh, as also in rashtrapati bhavan the rooms that were going to be used by their majesties uh but i did i did very solid conservation work on this building because it's very large 360 lodges and rooms uh, really between 85 and 89 for 5 years and um, i mean i'm delighted that i was asked to do it i'm research based i did a lot of research on my own from the royal institute of british architects where all the drawings are um, which possess all the drawings of from uh, the lachens collection and um, so you know there is i think uh, lachens is delhi is in the news for all the wrong reasons if you ask me 
uh, because Lachian's, I will go on to say what was what he did not do, which was correct. But what he did do architecturally was very right. He he established the sixth order to the Western order of uh, of architecture, on which all Western architecture is used, and this is called the Delhi order. And these temple bells, etc., he took from because he knew that bells were used in Hindu temples, in Jain temples, and in Buddhist temples. And the, the picture that you see, the image that you see on the right is from the Bhojpur temple again in Madhya Pradesh. And also, Lachins took a lot from, uh, the reason why I showed Red Fort earlier is from the Lahore gate. If you see the elephants and you see Rashtrapati Bhavan, what Lachins did with the elephants, and if you see the image to the right, these are the fan lights, which you can see from the Mughal gardens in Rashtrapati Bhavan. And the image to the right are Mughal jalis. He took from this. He took from this. He also took the color that you see in Fatehpur Sikri. I mean, uh, the red and the buff colored sandstone that he used. And if you see India Gate, which was also uh, designed and built by him, and this in the, on both sides of India Gate, you have these stone acorns to the right. Now, this he took from the acorn which he saw in the Vatican, these bronze acorns. He acknowledged this source. However, he never acknowledged his Indian sources and which he actually took extensively off because <clears throat> the architectural historian, I'm not going to go at length into this because this is a lecture, can be a lecture on its or a talk on its own. The architectural historian, Philip Davies, called it a double magnificence because although the form of Rashtrapati Bhavan is Renaissance, but all the deep chhajjas, the chhatris, the fountains uh, with the snake fountains, the lotus fountains, everything he took from India as also all in the interiors, all the carpet ma uh, making is, was done from the Agra, Amritsar and Lahore jails. All the furniture was made from the Lahore uh, workshops and some of the workshops were also for wood, wood making. So he took, he took a lot, but this was a colonial mindset he did not acknowledge it as he acknowledged what he, what he uh, took from the West. Having said that, the most important thing is that what he gave to us is a city of great beauty, which we can really all be proud of. And the, one of the six garden cities in the world. So when today, things like Central Vista and all are in the news, I think they're in the news for the wrong reasons of at least a wrong uh, because, because we have so Indianized everything now, and in, in any case, these are uh, the, these are buildings which are very hybrid. Whether this or if we, this is the interiors, this was in 1931 when Rashtrapati Bhavan uh, was uh, declared open. This is what I did in '86 for Go Mr. Gorbachev's visit, and this I did in 2012 for uh, the visit of uh, President Obama. And this is with Mrs. Clinton. And this I show in, in uh, Roosevelt House, which is again a well-known place in, in, um, in Delhi because it's a residence of the American ambassador. And we had Malvika Sarukai dance there for that. And of course, it's another story that OP and I set up this extremely beautiful outside tent for it. And then it poured. So everything had to be moved indoors. But Malvika is such a great friend of all of ours. And according to me, one of the greatest dancers in the world. So I thought we should acknowledge that. And this is, of course, the central vista. You see the Rashtrapati Bhavan and the, and the two secretariat buildings uh, from. Um, so this, this, part of India, uh, this part of Delhi I've been very involved with, such as Hyderabad House, which for many years uh, has always been where the uh, where the prime minister and the vice president are allowed to entertain and they uh, entertain. And these are the, there were two courts. Again, this, for the first time in its history in 1989, it was completely shut for nine months 
where I worked on everything from the air conditioning to the electricals to uh, this, uh, this uh, setting and designing this courtyard uh, in a Lachinesque way because it was all full of pebbles and it had completely gone. So uh, wherever, and as you know, I don't need to tell you all, there is a big difference between design and conservation and restoration because as a designer, if one is doing a hotel, one is looking at establishing uh, a scheme of things, a design scheme. But when one is working as a conservationist, one hopes that in two years time, everybody would have forgotten that there was an intervention by somebody else other than the original architect. And that to me is successful conservation. And these are some of the inside rooms and uh, this is South Block, which I've worked on extensively. On one end of it is uh, the PMO, which I also worked on. And I worked on, uh, for the first time in its history, I cleaned the six foot uh, pipes that run underneath that carry all the electrical services. So I had every single pipe taken out, identified what was dead, removed, new ones installed. So, you know, a lot of people think that because I have spent a lifetime doing hotels and public buildings that one has led a sort of a glamorous life. No, it's only been with, with pipes and cement and because one has only been in, you know, there when things are being built. I mean, once something is built, people move in and the glamour begins. I am out of it as a designer. Uh, then this is a British Council building, uh, which is in New Delhi. And uh, the exterior that you see was done by Howard Hodgkin, who was a great friend, I'm sure so know of yours, as he was of mine. The building is by Charles Courier. I did all the interiors from inside. And I've also done this uh, Indira Gandhi Memorial Museum. And the reason why I show it is, it's a small museum built by Ro Sir Robert Tor Russell. He did all the houses but the most visited museum on a daily basis in Asia, hold your breath, because people come from all over India and to come and see this museum. Uh, then I worked on the Millennium Book on Delhi. I mean, through one's life, one has contributed various essays. And this is the interior that is uh, used in this in this book. This is the Ashoka Hall, which incidentally I also restored during that big restoration phase that I did. And of course, I've come back to it after, you know, from time to time, not worked on these buildings throughout, because these are government buildings and it's up to them to do what they do in between. But I have to say that the PMO through nine prime ministers has remained unchanged, which makes me happy. That means one did something right for the prime minister of a country and not for any individual. Uh, then this is Nyla Fort, which I did for Mr. Mr. Oberoi as his private residence. And here, uh, I don't have many photographs of this, but here I, uh, you know, I used Pietra Dura, which I saw in Lahore and in Agra and in Agra Fort extensively and architecturally not in boxes and tabletops and all as it had been used before. And this, this absolutely exquisite uh, uh, fountain in marble and Pietra Dura, I had it copied exactly for Mr. Oberoi's, for one of the, for one of his courtyards. I mean, therein lies the amazing skill of our craftsmen and I hope they live a thousand years more, or rather that these crafts carry on for another thousand years. Amazing, Sunita, that's so fabulous that you could work on these spectacular buildings. Well, Sunita did get the uh, Padma Shri for the work, uh, the restoration work and the, uh, the interior work for Rashtrapati Bhavan and the public buildings of the government. And, uh, you know, you have done, I mean, it's just so exciting. This is like a dream project for anybody. And you have simultaneously worked on other countries too. And I know that Egypt has been very, very close to your heart and you did these hotels for the Oberois. So will you tell us a little bit about the projects and the cultural influences of that region? I will, I'd be delighted to. I've been to Egypt 60 times, so no. 
So, I mean, I, I, the first time I went, you know, I get so excited that I saw the country from Alexandria to Abu Simbel, to all of Sinai, to the houses of Fustad, thinking I might never come back because I'd been given my first project. Little realizing that I would be given project after project after project. Because let me tell you, in my profession, you're only as, large as, as, as good as your last project. So uh, I, as I said, I've explored from Alexandria and this is Abu Kir, and this is of course the city of the poet Kawafi, which I love and Lawrence Durrell's uh, Alexandrian quartet and all that. So, I mean, I just loved Alexandria. Though of course, everybody, all the old people who stay there, Alexandria is not the Alexandria of what it used to be during their grandmother's time. And interestingly in the, you know, this is how one, one looks at uh, history and archeology. span This is an exhibition I saw two years ago at the British Museum. And these are two, uh, th this, they showed only 7% of what they have excavated from the Mediterranean Sea. And these are the two lost cities that sank in, one being Cleopatra city. And what you cannot make out here is that this head lying at the bottom of the sea, which of course they have lifted now, is nine feet. So you can imagine the scale of everything else. And what they have excavated, as I said, is only 7%, but this is a joint venture between, uh, between uh, Egyptian archeologists, British archeologists, and some from other countries also. So there's still hope for us. I hope we can do Dwarka and all the other sun cities, Pompohar in South India and uh, others like that. Uh, then of course the pyramids of Giza, I stayed, uh, I mean, I worked on a hotel called the Mina House, which overlooks these and where you see the Sphinx and, um, and uh, the, the, the pyramid of Cheops is where many, many years ago um, was the opera that was based uh, over here, and it's uh, it, Ida. Uh, it Ida, was so I, Ida and uh, from Verona, and it was so fabulous, and we were all there. It was quite amazing. So uh, there are so many memories of this is the Mina House overlooking it, and I always have always stayed in the same suite, uh, maybe one floor up or down, depending if it was occupied, but always overlooking that. And then this is, I refurbished the main uh, Mina house. And I also worked on an extension of 250 rooms, which had this brasserie. Now Mina house has all been done with uh, the study of Islamic and particularly Mamluk architecture and Islamic because, uh, uh, and this is the first casino that the Oberoi's did. And this is uh, even though, uh, and I used, I used uh, orientalist paintings done by a wonderful chap of all the begums and the bibis, just so that it was very glamorous. And when it opened and, you know, with Mr. Oberoi and all his guests and all that, I mean, they couldn't get over who were these absolutely stunning looking women because I only women are there because I thought, why not? I mean, I think women are the fairer species. <laughs> May I be forgiven Absolutely. for saying that? Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, then of course, Luxor, why I'm quickly showing you this is because I designed three boats on the Nile and which go between Luxor and Aswan. And, uh, and the boat is called the Philae Cruiser. And the Philae, this Philae Temple and the one I showed before of Abu Simbel were the two that were raised above the surface of the water when the Aswan Dam was created so that they would not be submerged. And this was done all with international cooperation. So, I mean, this is a story everybody knows. So this is what can happen. And this hotel with that terribly ugly tower I had done 250 rooms of again and various parts of other things. But in those days in Egypt, when this hotel was built, they used to be, interestingly, they used to be paid by the amount of concrete that was poured in. So, you know what happened? Everybody poured more and more concrete into it. Okay, so this is a perspective of the pharaonic bar I had done. And this is, of course, uh, goes, you know, all, everything that one sees between Luxor, Abu Simbel, and Aswan. And then I did this boat, which 
uh, which was a unique experience for me. I had done two other boats for the Oberoi's, the Oberoi Shehriyar and the Oberoi uh, Shehrizad. One I did with pharaonic artifacts and the other I did with Islamic uh, artifacts. But this, uh, this boat, the way I chose to approach it is, if you remember Sonu in the 19th century, every gentleman uh, of means, after he'd finished his university, he had to do the grand tour, which was Italy, Greece, and Egypt. So Egypt was an integral part of that grand tour to finish their education, so to speak. So I chose to do it turn of the century way, you know, of that time. And I have to say that out of the 250 boats, hotel boats, luxury boats that were plying on the Nile then, uh, because every major hotel had a hotel boat. I mean, every major hotel company in the world had a hotel boat on the Nile. And uh, this one, the best this one award for the best design boat on the Nile. I mean, that was many years ago, so, but that was a fact. And, and this is how I just have shown just these few uh, drawings because unlike today where everybody and our whole office works on computers and CAD and everything, we drew our drawings. If you remember, oh, everybody's too young. I'm the oldest here as I'm- Amazing. As I no, am, no. I, Huh? It's amazing. It's amazing to see real drawings. Yeah. And you could not just, uh, you know, rub off things. You actually had to remove the ink and do it. So, and Mr. Obra always said, he said, the best architectural drawings come from your studio. So this is the lobby lounge and this is the finished lobby lounge. It comes exactly the same because everything is done to, to, to one scale. eighth of an inch. I mean, they're absolutely scaled drawings. And this was of the of the suites. Uh, all these, all the rooms were guest suite, guest suites, and rather than having portholes, all the windows were down to the ground. So you could be lying on your bed, and you could be watching the Nile and what was on either side of the Nile pass by. So, um, and this was actually this was the first hotel I did, which was eighty two, I think, in El Arish, which is a also mentioned in the Bible. And I, I always like to work with local craftsmen. So these, uh, these uh, date palms that you see, because El Arish is full of dates. I had these made, I had these cast in brass from an actual date palm using that as the dye. And the fronds are made out of baladi glass because glass has been made in Egypt since the eighth century. And then this was, uh, the tented bar, and of course, you know, this has wonderful kilims, this whole area. It's biblical, it's sand, it's on the north coast of the Mediterranean. So I had uh, bought uh, various kilims, and I had those woven in for the tented fabric. So that's Egypt. And then Egypt, uh, at that time, Inside Outside, which was the largest circulating design magazine, and still is actually. Still, you yes, know, we've had a lot of glossy. So they, they did a whole feature on my trip to Egypt and uh, uh, and uh, and for the first time they sent somebody outside the country. That was Sunil Sethi, who's a well-known writer. And uh, I can't remember Jugnu's real name and Jugnu as the photographer. So it was a wonderful trip and I'm grateful to Inside Outside. So that's Lovely. the Egypt story. How fantastic, how absolutely magnificent some of these things are. And you know, another country that you told me that you have loved working in was uh, Bhutan and you did their parliament building in Thimphu, which I understand is the most significant public building for that country. So why don't you tell us a little bit more? It's a completely different culture. You know, uh, one of the things I love doing uh, Sonu is I like constantly being challenged as a designer. Because uh, I enjoy research, I enjoy history, I enjoy archeology, span I enjoy architecture. One is always, you know, one has been actually fortunate that I worked in so many different cultures and often this simultaneous research has been going on, uh, you know, in my study, in my studio and all of that. So uh, the story actually of Bhutan began in Bangalore, but that's another story altogether at the retreat for heads of state 
for SAC. And uh, any case, I was eventually appointed over various other people from the states and all that who had been thing. So my first thing was now I knew we are talking about Bhutan of 1988. Nobody had gone there. There were no books on Bhutan, excepting one little book by G. N. Mehra, History of Bhutan, which I couldn't find a copy of, which a friend who'd been uh, ambassador in Bhutan, I had a photocopy uh, made. So the first thing was when I was appointed and everything like this, I was, frankly, I was delighted because it's a country I'd always wanted to visit. And now to have the opportunity of actually working in this culturally very rich country. So, uh, you know, uh, as I said, there was very little, I heard that there was one, uh, there was a big, uh, big exhibition on Buddhism, which was going to happen at the Royal Academy in London. So I took the next flight and went charging they covered Buddhism in every country barring Bhutan. So in any case, I came back with as much knowledge as I had before. But what the king did, which is K4, the present king's father, once I was appointed, they opened every door for me. So I had a Bhutanese Buddhist guide who was like a walking encyclopedia as my guide. And I traveled from one end of the country and I was allowed to visit any Zong and work with any craftsman. So this, I'm showing Simphoka Zong, which is the oldest Zong. And uh, I want to point out these windows because you'll see what I did with these windows, which is also a first. And uh, this is a Tashicho Zong, which is exactly opposite, uh, which is the head both for secular and sacred Bhutan. And this is uh, Thikse Monastery, which is the oldest in, in uh, which is the largest in Bhutan. And this is Bumthang on the, on the, on the Eastern side. So one, tra and several, I can't mention, and even beyond Bumthang, I've traveled. I've traveled extensively. I've made many, many trips. And, and this is the National Assembly building, which I designed both exterior, interior, and then in 2010 for the SAC summit, first time being held in Thimpu, they asked, they invited both Kohilika and me to come and we did extensive work. Did not change any of the interiors or the exteriors that were then done in 1988, 89, uh, including all the paintwork that you see outside, absolutely done with their master craftsmen. Uh, and the assembly hall remained the same as I had done then with this ceiling which I had done of several mandalas and uh, uh, because I wanted to use mandalas because they bestow blessings on all those who are below and I worked with great experts the the librarian of the national uh, library uh, who was a lama and also the head the director of the national museum and I worked with many master weavers also um, and this was, what, uh, this was what was created in 2010, the VVIP lounge for the visiting heads of state. As I said, uh, the interior architecture is from 1989, but all the furniture is from 2010. And I removed all the, uh, you know, all the fussiness that used to go into a Bhutanese, very simple, but interior and just made it with 1930s and 20s Art Deco furniture, but all their artifacts. So that's Bhutan. That's amazing. The combination of, of this very contemporary with their uh, artifacts, where their artifacts stand out, it's lovely. And the ceiling, it's so magnificent. Thank you. So Sunita, you co-founded K2 with Kohilika your daughter who uh, came back from America in 2010 and have done lots of residences all across India. Will you walk us through at least a few of those? Because that's another aspect. That's another thing. Uh, you know, this, I quickly show a few, res uh, I mean, just three or four. This I had done in 2004 and why I'm showing it because a lot of people think this is Kohilika's work because it's so contemporary. But you know, I, as you know, I have a very liberal and a very contemporary mindset, even though I'm completely rooted in one's own culture. 
So this is uh, the living room of that area. And the way I like to work is, you know, ceilings that are totally contemporary with contemporary Vanini lights, uh, but there is gold and silver. And that's pure gold, pure silver. To me signifying, no, and to uh, all of us signifying Ganga Jamna Tehzeeb, which means, which means the, which means syncretic culture, you know, uh, Hindu and Islamic culture that goes so well together and is melded together. And uh, then this is uh, a house that K2 India and uh, Kohilika date, which is a bungalow. And it's the interior of it, the living room looking one side and the dining room towards the other side, creating this wonderful orphilad. And this is the staircase of this house, which is like a sculpture by itself. And this is the second floor apartment for their son and he wanted to work with this color palette. So Kohilika did this, did this for him. And this is the terrace which they use extensively. And incidentally, uh, you know, the columns that you see there, Sono, yeah. are the ones that we picked up when you and I went to Chetanad together. Do you remember when we went to Rameshwaram and all that? Yes, yes. So now you yes. see how they've been placed. So that was that. And uh, uh, and that's the interior of a rather unique bathroom created by Kohelika, the barrel bathroom. And uh, uh, this is an, now this is an apartment which is in, uh, uh, which is in, uh, in Magnolias. And one second, I wanted to show you the living room. Yeah, this is the living room of this apartment, which flows into this dining room. And this is a very wide balcony outside with a wonderful view. And this is the study of it. And this is another part of the study. Again, I've used Gond paintings here. So this shows you just a sampling of dozens and dozens <coughs> of houses that we've done throughout the country. You know, uh, Sunita, you've also had a great presence in the annual design fair in Delhi every year. And each year, I'm always amazed at your spaces. So why don't you show us some of those over these years? Okay, so I'll show you last year, as you know, this year didn't happen because we're in the midst of the age of COVID. So uh, this is last year. And we always have stayed with the same space, but done it totally differently. So this is 2019. This is an interior of it, uh, 2019. And if you will recollect, uh, Sono, what we saw in the summer palace in Tipu Sultan. Yes, yes. Yeah. The coloring, the palette, this, yes. Uh, this is March of last year. This is February of last year. But this is where I think for designers, architects, art people in art, curating art, this is where racial memory takes over you know, in the color scheme. It's completely contemporary. And yet it's so, it can, it's so much like that 19th century, uh, 18th century palace, that palette that we saw in the summer palace. If you look at this further, it's all from yes. that same year. Then this is 2000, it's the same space. This is 2000 and and 18, more robust, more masculine. This is the way Kohelika wanted it. And uh, this is 2017. This is with, with, with ash pink and, and, you know, it's another palette. It's a totally different way of looking at it because also not only uh, does Kohelika showcase, uh, you know, uh, aspects of interior design, but also the new range of furniture that we are going to, uh, that we have developed for the year. And as you know, you know, we've been making furniture for the last uh, 49 years or something. So uh, this is from another year and, uh, and always the lights are different. The lights are magnificent. They're sourced from around the world. These are Bocchi lights, who's a designer in Canada. And this is, uh, these are uh, just details of from the same place. And this is in 2015, this is the exterior, uh, which, you know, every time the space is planned differently also. And this is the interior uh, where Kohilika, what you just, you see one edge of it, but it's a, 
22 foot long uh, piece of teak wood which Kohilika got from Borneo. So this is another thing. So that I've shown you uh, K2 India at India Design. A few you years know, of it, yes. You know, all of you can see where her great, her, she's a great narrator. Sunita's always had <laughs> these lovely nar narratives that she's given us when we've traveled and I've learned a lot from her. So, I've learned uh, so much from you, please, and from all of you. I mean, <laughs> no, you know. we've learned so much. And, and now I know that you're doing a lot of books. And your literary background, your literature, I mean, I know you've studied literature and, and that has played a very important role in how you've inte intellectualized a lot of the design ideas that have come. I mean, because it's not that every interior des designer can connect the old and the new so beautifully as you've done. And it comes you. from your uh, extensive reading, obviously, your, your knowledge, your, your, you know, the way you've gone into things. So tell us a little bit more about your writing and uh, introduce us to some of the books that you're doing. Because I know, I know I have one of it that you just gave me when you released it. But tell us a little bit more about this. Uh, yes. Uh, you know, I, uh, after I'd done my B honors, my master's in literature, and I worked on a PhD on Christopher Marlowe, which I did not complete. And I do not think I can ever complete it now because you know, life changes, things happen in life. I thought I was so totally in love with Marlowe. There was nothing beyond Marlowe, but you know, there are, there are other loves also in life as life progresses. Uh, and I'm glad that design found me and I found design more importantly. Uh, I did the Lucknow cookbook with my mother, which I have to say was, has been to every single literary festival in India, barring Chennai, but that fault is mine, why I didn't come to, uh, why, because I hadn't responded. Uh, and uh, we also had, uh, in fact, we also, when we were all together in Maheshwar, if you'll remember, um, Vidya, we yes. did a book launch there with uh, Richard, which was wonderful in Maheshwar. This is a new a book which was released in uh, in um, uh, January of this year and the second edition has come out uh, just a couple of weeks ago and uh, and uh, it has wonderful contributors. I've been the editor for this book uh, called Kala, uh, Essays on Contemporary Design Aesthetics and all the contributors are of course friends of mine and uh, but I, I'm I'm uh, what should I say fortunate in the friends that one has had and has and so these have come out two other books will come out later this was supposed to have actually been now launched in Milan London and Edinburgh in April but April has gone COVID saw to that so it's all now postponed to next April I don't worry about these things and then it's going to have an all India launch and hopefully also one in Chennai as it will also have in Colombo. So um, um, this book is out. Then I'm doing two other major books for the same. One is on heritage and one is on design. But before both these happen, the two books that will come out by the end of this year, one is the International Cookbook and one is which I'm doing for something called Women's International Club. I'm the editor for it. And another book is the India Cookbook, which certainly both of you have contributed to. So we all look forward to that. And every recipe is acknowledged. And it's a, so one is, it's really like a cuisine memoir. So I think now I've contributed so many essays to so many books throughout one's, one's I guess, professional career. So now is also time to go back to the discipline one studied. Wow. Amazing. Sunita, <laughs> what a treat this has been. Absolutely lovely. I mean, you know, when you when you see your whole trajectory of how you started, how you're going back, how you've used all the, the learnings and your ideas, it's been absolutely fabulous. And the amount you've talked about Chennai, you know that we have listeners that have come in from all over India today. So I'm sure they'll all be in Chennai very soon and we're very happy to have them. <laughs> but Sunita, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't know how well, to thank you. For thank this you so much for, for the wonderful intro and for this wonderful session. No, so no, I can't thank you enough. 
No, thank and you. And Rinku you us, and Vidya. No, you thank get us you. into this beautiful, beautiful journey of yours with such great generosity. Thank you. So let's ask the public for some questions. So Vidya, can I give it over to yes. you? Uh, yes, uh, Sumita, we have a few questions which have come in. Sure. And uh, I'm trying to uh, read them out to you. Uh, the first one that has come in is, apart from your professional life, tell us a bit about your work with underprivileged women and children. Uh, now, Vidya, firstly, uh, I am very privileged. I come uh, from a very privileged background simply because uh, I am educated. I think therein that's where privilege begins from. I mean, yes. if I take my, my parents, they lost everything when they moved during the time of partition, but they came up with their education and their value systems. That's and right. that never goes away from anybody. So this has been an interest for a long time. Uh, uh, one was with Umang, eventually also president of Umang, where we had the first major fundraiser that the country had ever seen, in the style that they had ever seen. And Vidya, it would interest you because I had built all these chhatris only with white mongras and oh, perfectly architecturally done and we had abida parveen who'd come from lahore to sing and everything that every man and his wife said why don't you do this wedding for us i said excuse me you know <laughs> i'm a designer i will do it for my own ngo but you know this is not my this is not my field i didn't know you then otherwise i would promptly have sent you to <laughs> them to you <laughs> The, the other uh, the other one is uh, sorry and, go ahead uh, you know one has worked with uh, with with women in in uh, with making women literate this is Satyagyan Foundation uh, in Banaras and uh, we have so far with our partners made twenty three thousand women literate uh, uh, it's not that they get a high school degree or anything like that but they can go to a bank, they can, uh, they can make a police report because as you, you know, most of their husbands are drunks and drug addicts and uh, then dealing with their children. And then of course there's Save a Mother and uh, Save a Mother is, it works with, with reducing mortality rates. And our record has been uh, with spending 12,000 rupees per village uh, per year we have reduced mortality rates, uh, I mean, made 97% of, of pregnant women will survive because of what we are teaching them. That, that is amazing to be able to contribute that much to women. Uh, one more question has come in, Sunita, and uh -huh. that is, what is your latest and most exciting project that you have on your hands now? You know, you, I don't need a project. It or is it a secret? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't need a project to be high on life because basically I am yeah. high on life in any case. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, the new project, uh, one, one of the interesting new projects is a museum of transport that one is designing. And in this India? Is a, in India or, a, or overseas? No, in, in Delhi, just outside yeah. Delhi. It's called the Lovely. Titus Museum. And Lovely. he has probably one of the finest collection of vintage cars wow. and wins many international prizes and all the rest of it. So uh, that's an interesting project. That's, we are going to look forward to visiting the museum when it's ready. Absolutely, yes. And I think one, one more question that came in was, how do you think this uh, pandemic has uh, impacted on your on uh, design in India work-wise and... Uh, I don't know about actual designing, but work definitely would be uh, something that people will be concerned about. Well, you know, firstly, that I think uh, at a personal level, it made us all put our fingers on the pause button, which I think is good because it made us reflect on what really is important in life and what is the, what the peripherals that really do not matter at all. Having right. said that, I mean, professionally, of course, all of us have been impacted uh, from the design. You know, design is one part of our business and furniture manufacturing is another part of our business. Design could still carry on, but the construction 
I mean, building of homes that we are working on, etc., all came to a grinding halt. The lessons to be learned from that are: if you're going to be using migrant labor, better make sure that they are well looked after, and we don't have the absolute disaster that took place. I don't want to go into that. Everybody knows the yeah. reasons for it, and etc. So there's there should be a different way of working. If you're working with people who are laborers, mazdoor, semi-skilled people, skilled people, what is it that we should be doing uh, for them? I can say personally that all our craftsmen, we have master craftsmen as far as uh, as far as our furniture is concerned, because we are of which I'm proud of. We are known for a certain quality that we produce. All of them have they live in their own homes. We told them to stay at home. Not an item of furniture was being manufactured, but we looked after them. And because if people have worked with you for 35, 40 years, this is what I think you owe to them because it is because of them also that we have our businesses. Absolutely. Um, That's well but said. the new initiatives that are, are two, I which I'll say very quickly. One is that we've also learned how to work efficiently, remotely, many from our homes. Uh, the second thing is that we are doing these Zoom talks in which are, uh, I don't see any difference in, I mean, earlier nobody would have even dreamt of doing a talk like this. In fact, the last talk I had was also Fiki Float March 8th or March 7th, you know, but what physically went to Hyderabad for that. So, uh, and now we are Zoom. I mean, it's the same thing to me, really. And uh, the second thing is, you know, there are platforms like Sonu has brought uh, D and A plus a platform where she's got 15, uh, uh, 15 uh, firms. And one of them is ours, people who are in manufacturing, people who are dealing in art, artifacts, uh, soft furnishing, we in furniture and, and some art, uh, I mean, some artifacts or whatever. So to bring it all together and to think of how you can do it so that That's right. the larger lot benefits from uh, such things. So this is the way forward, I think. And I think this will become more and more sophisticated as the, as the year goes by, okay. because I don't think this age of COVID has yet reached its end. You're quite right. The end is nowhere in sight. Yeah. So I think it's a great, what you said is absolutely right. We've got to look after the people who come down the ladder working for all these projects. Yes, yes. And uh, I'm just going to ask uh, Rinku or Jayashree if there are any other questions that they'd like, if they've received anything else. Otherwise, we can hand um, over to Jayashree. Yeah, I think there are. So, but we are running short of time. And so, uh, Rinku, would you like to just do one more? Maybe I'll take the last one. Uh, this is from our member Kajal Lalwani and she says, Sunita, you are a legend. What would you leave as a legacy for the world? Wow, what a lovely question. Yeah, and I thought this would yeah. actually be the really nice question to wrap up the session. Wrap up the program. Kajal, thank you so much. That was a great question. I, I, I Firstly, I have to say I'm not a legend. I belong <laughs> to the working classes. I really do. And Perhaps one of the things that, uh, if there's anything that I can leave behind as something I think uh, maybe a younger generation may follow, may choose to follow, that I have always believed that there is no substitute for education and hard work. That is what really produces what one does. And to always work with sincerity. I've spent almost 50 years uh, being sincere towards uh, my clients, being uh, sincere towards projects, being sincere towards the cultural milieus in which I have been fortunate enough to work. So I don't know whether that's a legacy or not, but all that I can say is this is the way I did it. This was my tune. And everybody is there to really sing their own songs. That's Amazing. Really Amazing. Yeah. So Indian architecture has a lot of heart and soul in it, so whether it's really done or old and dilapidated. So the charm it carries is otherworldly. So I wish to applaud you for the great service that you're doing in restoring such 
legendary buildings and structures. It was fascinating to listen to all the inside stories of all your projects. And adding to it, I'm glad that you chose to take the time out to write your story as your journey will inspire so many upcoming designers who need direction. And I pray you continue to write, design, and add a lot more things in your palette to amuse your creativity. Working for 50 years, that's actually unbelievable. Your work is amazing from Rashtrapati Bhavan to cruisers in River Nile. And you're so knowledgeable. You cover temples, churches, mosques, sports, and even archaeological sites. And as Chennai, it was exciting to hear you talk about Rikadeshwan Temple, Sri, Lanka, Sri Rangam Temple, and Kumbuhar. So it was great. It was great to have two stalwarts on this show a Padma Shri Abadi and a global figure in the field of architecture on one side. And on the other side, one of the most acclaimed curators and promoters of art, our own member, Sharon of Barrao. So Sharon, you are brilliant and you helped to bring to life Sunita's amazing journey in adding a new personality to Indian architecture. Thank you once again, Sunita and Sharon, for this fantastic session. I thank all the past chairs, past presidents, GB members, and our, our own members for your time. And uh, your participation is what makes us, you know, keeps us going even in this situation when we are unable to hold the grand flow event. So thank our sponsors, Satibama University, uh, Fredai Chennai and Radiant Group, and also members of the press for their support. Look forward to seeing you all at our next Zoom session with Nitisha Nishita Chortia on making designs on Swedish. Thank you all once again. Thank, you, thank, you, thank you so thank much. You, thank, thank you, you Vidya, so for thank having you, bye, me. Bye, bye, thank bye you, Vidya. Thank you so bye, much. Bye, thank bye you, Sono. Lady. You were thank fantastic. You. And thank, thank you, Rinko, you. for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so thank much. You thank so much. you. Bye, bye. Really be an honor. Truly. Bye. Vidya and Sono. Thank you. Really. Applaud you both. Amazing. Thank, thank you. 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 Thank you.